Now, last week, Pastor Hawkins, who's the preaching machine of the universe, him and his little silky, Pastor Brett had a silky, he's got it, look at that, Pastor Hawkins, you're getting competition up here, little pocket thing. All right, so he talked about James 4 and about the contrast between pride and something popping. This, it may be me. <clears throat> okay. Between pride and humility. Jada, when I say something funny, you laugh from your belly, okay? Your, your mama told me that I'm really funny and that you don't always get it. And I'm going to pray for you today that the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right. Just going to get that out there right now. So uh, the thing of it is, is, is uh, uh, what was I talking about anyway? <laughs> pride. Yeah, he, he contrasted pride and humility. And you remember he said that there's hand signals in this text. God resists the proud, remember? He opposes. He invites and loves those that are humble and invites them. And, and then... When you humble yourself and go low and repent and die to yourself, he picks you up. Get on your knees and repent, he picks you up. I love that picture. I loved all that. Now, I'm going to do a message. It's weird because I'm not a good preacher, okay? That was a joke, Jada. I'm a great preacher. Uh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read all of chapter 4, and I'm going to look at it as a picture. There's 17 verses. And where I'm coming from is that depending on your viewpoint about God and what you think about God and what you think about yourself has to do with how you relate to others, how you uh, connect with God, and what you do about the future. Now, there are some of you that right now, you know, you're, a little fear grips your heart because you've been unemployed for a while. We have a couple families. This got an issue there, and I'm telling you what people say to me. In fact, some of you, one person said, I decided to come to church because when your family, church, your family, and when somebody suffers, you come along and pick them up. So we, we just want to do a dollar blessing. We don't know what that is. That's just when you pass down dollars, and, and hopefully because we have a couple, we can be real generous, and let's just bless. You want to bless someone at Christmas? Let's bless them. So I'm going to ask the guys to come. And while they come, I want to tell you a little. We got a baby. Who is this? <laughs> Who? Chad, this is Jacob Leonard Glenn. Ne uh, Nicole, Nicole? And is, her, is Mama Nicole? Yeah, they're back there. Chad? Campbell? And who is it? Jacob. Jacob. Yep. What's, does he have a middle name? Leonard Glenn. Jacob Leonard Glenn Campbell. That's a name right there. Stand up back there, Campbells, Nicole, and there they are, Chad and Nicole. God bless you. Congratulations. It's awesome. Look at that. Would you look at that? Wow. Look at that little hat. Pull that hat off of there. He's not cold. I'll come pull it off. There. There we go. Woo! Look at that. That is awesome. Here you go, buddy. Okay. That is cool. Well, welcome that little fella to church. That's the way you grow the church right there. The rest of you get with it and let's be making some babies here, okay? How many of you know I'm from Waco, Texas? Used to be Waco when I grew up, but then date Crazy Koresh changes to Waco. You remember that? Any of y'all remember that? Yeah, the, yeah, there was some bombs and everything else going off back then. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm going to see my mom this week in, in, uh, in Waco, and I'm also going to, it just happens that my college coach, Bill Menifee, he was a great man. He was a, like Tom Landry. Uh, he was a, a gentleman. He was an amazing coach. He recruited me to Baylor. He gave me a full athletic scholarship to play basketball. The unfortunate thing is he retired after my sophomore year. Then we had a couple of less than average coaches for about 10 years. If you're on the screen, I still love you, though you couldn't coach. And uh, that's funny, Jada. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'm from Texas. And in Texas, everything's big. If you fall in the pool, you better be sure you don't flush, because it might be a toilet. And 
when this Texas farmer t headed off to Australia, how many have been to Australia? I, I want to go someday to Australia. It's a great place to visit, I hear. And it's not cheap to get there. But anyway, this Texas farmer, he went to Australia for a vacation, and he, he met an Australian farmer, Aussie farmer. And he <clears throat> showing off, the Aussie farmer started showing off his big wheat field at Texas and said, man, this is nothing in Texas. We, our wheat fields are twice this big. And then next thing you know, he takes them over to the field, and he shows them all of his cows and how wonderful and beautiful they are. And he goes, to this isn't nothing. I mean, in Texas, our longhorns are twice as big as your cows. For a long, he's kind of settled down there. The Aussie's being very, very, very polite, and, you know, didn't get into it with him, you know. And, but before long, the Texan looked out over in the field, and he saw these group of kangaroos just hopping through the field. The Texan never seen anything like it. He said, what are those? And that Aussie farmer says, well, hadn't you ever seen grasshoppers? <laughs> Don't y'all have any of those in Texas? So I want, I tell you that for a reason. That's a funny story, you can, if you can tell it right. But, but I tell you that for a reason. I want you to remember the reason. And that is, it's all about your perspective, isn't it? It's about your perspective. And the question is, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Because who you are will tell you something about how you treat others. It, it will be seen in how you treat others. Who you think you are will affect how you relate to God. And who you think you are will be seen in how you view tomorrow and how you live today in relationship tomorrow. And that's what, as we read this, I'm going to read through the text. It's a little different message because I'm basically, I'm going to be a Bible commentary as I read through and talk about this text in the reference of who you think you are. Now, before I do that, let me, let me lay out a couple of things. Who you think you are has a lot to do with what you believe about God. Do you believe God knows everything? That he's all powerful, that he, that he is ever present, that he sees you all the time and hears everything you say and is always there. He knows when you are cursing, not Santa. <clears throat> he knows when you are greedy. He knows when you are lustful. He sees you when you're ugly. Acting ugly, I mean. He sees you when you're gossiping. He sees you when you complain. It's Jesus, not Santa Claus, right? That wasn't in my notes, but that was funny, Jada. <laughs> you see, do you believe that Adam was taken and made of the dirt and God, by his spirit, breathed life into him? Therefore, God, he is our God and we're his people. The psalmist said it. We, he is our God and we are the sheep of his pasture. Know ye not that he hath made us. He made us. We are his. In our mother's womb, we were conceived. And from the moment of conception, God knew us and had a plan for us and a direction for us. Are you with me? So how you look at God, what you believe about God, will affect what you believe about yourself and what you think about yourself. Who do you think you are? Who you think you are? So you can say, who do you think you are? Or who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Depends on how you say that. But it all has to do with what you believe about God. So as we read this passage, remember something. Your view toward yourself no matter what you say you, you think you are, what you really believe deep down about who you are comes out in how you relate to God, how you relate to others, and what you think about your future, what you really think you are. Pride, humility. We're going to see it in the Scripture. Spirit, flesh. Flesh-driven, sin-driven, Love-driven, spirit-driven. 
fruit of the Spirit driven or fruit of the flesh driven. So James chapter 4 starts off, and you see right away how you treat others. And I, I want to submit to you that he is on the subject that Pastor Jeff preached about a couple of weeks ago, that there's a worldly wisdom and there's a godly wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The way you look at God, do you respect him? Jesus said, don't be afraid of those that can kill your body, hurt you on earth. Fear the one who has the power of sending your soul to heaven or hell. That's what he said. He said, in other words, there's an eternity to face, and you need to be sure that the one you fear is God. We have so many people so full of fear that say they're, they're people of faith. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love and a sound mind. So it starts off with how you treat others. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Being proud, and God opposes that. That's my suggestion. It doesn't say that in Scripture, but it'll get to it. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He's talking about sinful desire. Do you know we're born sinners? All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. We are, we are born into this life selfish and sinful, and our heart must be changed. And the only way grace is empowered in us is when we humble ourselves and we wail and we weep. As Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. When you see yourself as a sinner, repentance is turning so deeply in your emotion that you cry out to God to forgive you and save you and change you because the truth is only God can do it. And how you view yourself and how you view God affects your relationship with others because as long as your heart is selfish, it'll be sinful, it'll be lustful, it'll be prideful and you'll have conflict in relationships. The best medicine for marriage healing is for both people to truly be spiritual and to repent and get the fruit of the Spirit in their life. What causes fights and quarrels? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you don't have. You kill. Oh, let's see who did that. Uh, King David? Yeah. He wanted Bathsheba. He made sure her husband died. He wanted her so much. He worked it out. He lied. You desire you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. There's coveting. That's, that's the word covet is to desire something greatly is the word to lust after. The Bible says in John, John the writer, the first John, he says, when it describes the world, when it describes the worldly kingdom, when it describes what we're born as, who we are before Christ changes our heart, it describes us this way. The world is the lust of the flesh. That's the things like food and sexual pleasure and, and other pleasures, the f things that, that make us feel good in the flesh. The lust of the eyes, that's materialism, the things you see that you want, and the pride of life. That's power and position, what others think of you, to be somebody, right? I don't want to be somebody. I want to glorify the one. I want to boast in the Lord. And, and I, 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 would tell, I would submit to you that James here is saying the same thing. He's saying that you, you covet you are in this world, it's, 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 it's grabbing a hold of you, you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight, it causes problems. You see it in bosses, how they oppress their workers. You see it in co-workers who are fighting and jockeying for position and will even lie about someone to cause a problem. You see it, and some of you struggle with it because of the sinful attitudes of people that you work with. You see it in how you treat a waiter, a server. You see it in how you treat people when you're driving. You see it in so many ways because if life is too much about us, if we don't understand how desperate we need Jesus to change our heart, if we don't understand that we are sinners saved by grace alone through faith, if we don't see that we're not better because we have Christ, we're thankful because we have Christ, and that everyone needs Jesus the way I need him, and I need Jesus every day the way everyone else does, and the only hope is Jesus. You don't have because you don't ask God. He says you quarrel, you fight, that's relational. You don't have because you don't ask God, and when you do, you don't receive it because you ask with wrong motives. 
It's all about us, isn't it? That you can spend it, that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. So then he says, you adulterous people. He's not talking about sexual adultery there. He's talking about having an affair with the world, loving the world. He's talking about the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. As someone once said, for a man, it would be girls, gold, and glory. Girls, gold, and glory. And, and, and so he says, you're having an affair with the world, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Are you an enemy of God when you're a friend of the world? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, the next verse that's going to be on the screen is wrong in the NIV. I'm 99.9999% that it's wrong. The King James Version has it right. And theologians differ on what this verse should be. But in context, it's clear that the King James writers had it right. It says it this way in the NIV. It says, or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit? Look at this. He has caused to dwell in us. In other words, what it's saying is that God has put his Holy Spirit in us, and he's jealous that we would pay attention to it and follow him. But I don't believe that's what it's saying because it's not in context. He's just told them that they're having an affair with the world, that, they're, that they're, they, 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 he's, he's confronting the, the, the pe people there, that their faith isn't real. But remember, because he's talked about faith without works is dead. He's saying, show me your faith by your works. Prove it. Words are cheap. Demons believe. They tremble. But they don't have eternal life. And, and so he's on that same subject. He's, he's, he's saying, um, uh, and, and I think the, the real thing, when he goes, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. And then he goes on, the King James says, don't you think the scriptures, do you think that the scripture says in vain? Or like, doesn't mean anything. I mean, you, think, you think he just said that and it's wrong? That the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? In other words, your human spirit is lustful. It's jealous. It's envious. It wants its own way. It always wants what someone else has. Do you think that the Bible doesn't teach that? Jeremiah says the, the human heart is desperately wicked. Okay? And you can't change your heart. I can't tell you your heart's bad and you go, ooh, me, i got to change. And you go out and change. No way. But right away, James tells us what can change your heart. Look what he says. He goes on, he says, he says uh, but he gives us more grace. That's why, he says, and, and he says, he gives us more grace, and that is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud. You're going to stay selfish, sinful, lustful, and prideful unless God's grace does something to you. Bill Gother in the Basic Youth Conflicts, and most any theologian will agree, that grace isn't just a definition of word that says, well, you can't buy your salvation, it's free. It's not that. It's God comes in with the power of his spirit to change your heart, give you a new desire, and then give you power to live it out. You understand what I'm saying? That's why when you ask Jesus in your life, you should be baptized in water, okay? Because it pictures you're dying to yourself. You identify with Christ who died and was buried. You bury. Therefore, he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and die to yourself daily, Jesus said. You're buried with him in baptism and risen to new life. Old things have passed away. All things become new in Christ Jesus. It is a powerful conversion that only Jesus can do by the power of God's grace that when you cry out, you weep, you wail, you repent, he comes in like a flood and changes your heart. Into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. See, it says there, you got a spirit in you that's sinful. If you're following and choosing after the world, it's sinful. Your, your human spirit in you is selfish. It's prideful. But God gives more grace. That's why the scripture says God opposes the proud. That's, as Pastor Hawkins said, God's hand against you. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's where he lovingly reaches his hand out and invites you in to forgive you and pick you up, love you. Now, humility isn't to think less of yourself. Humility is just to not think of yourself. 
Quit thinking about yourself so much. Think of others. Joy is Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Prefer one another in love. Right? The royal law of Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Be thinking about the other people. You with me? All right. So, God shows favor to the humble. It's when you say, I need you, Jesus. I think the greatest definition of humility is I need Jesus every minute, every hour. One of the greatest songs ever written is, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to you. I need you, Lord. You ever been in a situation where you're in church and the Holy Spirit was moving and boy, you sensed God and boy, you were determined, I'm going to follow God and I'm going to be right and you get in the car and your spouse says just the wrong thing and before you get home, you're angry with each other, you're not talking, you're going, shut up and maybe even sling a few curse words out when you just got through blessing God. How many of you have been there? Why? Because your flesh is ever present and until you are totally redeemed and your body's out of there, you're out of your body, this old body, this old nature, this old flesh, it wants to rise and it wars. It's full of envy and lust and it's full of greed and pride. But God changes you by his grace. You need him every day. And that's what humility is, remembering. There go I but the grace of God. Humility is that I need you, Jesus, all the time. Humility says I'm the first one to the altar. In fact, the, the closest people to God, when the Holy Spirit he does anything to shine a light on any bit, any speck of dirt in your living, are the first ones to get to the altar say, God, clean up that dirt. Help me, God, be closer to you. Help me overcome that. And they're honest. That's honest brokenness. Truth in the inward part. That's what David said. So he says, what do we do? He opposes the pride. He shows favor to the humble. So therefore, and I'm going to add that in because that's what it's, the implication is. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourselves so that you don't have quarrels among you because it affects how you treat others when you live for yourself and don't submit to God. When you're proud and arrogant. When you're having an affair with the world. Submit yourself then to God. How you view yourself tells whether or not you realize you can't win against the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, it says. Do you know the Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion seeking, roaming about seeking whom it may devour? Did you know you're no match for the devil? If you don't get your armor on every day, you're going to lose. If you don't realize there's an enemy you're so shooting darts, but he is firing darts of the wicked. There's a spiritual war. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you whether or not you... This is just a little quiz to get you to think here. Whether you're truly living this life out, wholly, totally committed to Christ, whether you're truly humble, whether you truly are submitting to God, whether you're truly drawing near to God, do you take time for the Word? you got 24, 24 hours in a day in the last seven days. Have you opened it up? Has God spoken to you? Have you meditated on His law? you be like a tree planted by the water. If you met that, they that meditate in the law day and night like a tree planted by the water and will not be moved. Do you pray? Do you worship? Do you witness? Do you care? Is your heart for the world the lost? You know, America is not going to be made great by a politician or a political group. Uh-uh. Ain't no way, Jose. We're going to continue to be lustful, greedy, and proud. Proud, pride, proudy. That was funny. Jada. What's going to make America great is, is what was noticed years, many hundreds of years ago is when the church becomes the church and people that call themselves by the name of Jesus Christ get on their knees and humble themselves and repent and call upon God and become the holy people of God and not and the peculiar people of God and the separated people of God, the people who live what they really say they believe and they're not having an affair with the world all the time trying to use God like a Santa Claus to get a little ticket to heaven because they're not really serious about understanding what the world needs. You see, what the world needs is an Amway plan, a spiritual Amway plan. I win one who wins one who wins one who wins one. Then I win another one who wins one and wins one and wins another one. Then I win another one who wins one and wins one and wins another one. 
You see, the world, America, is going to be made great again when it gets back to its roots of bowing down before God, repenting of their sins, even the sins of their forefathers, and, and that their hearts are full of love, and they see people the way God sees them, and they feel about things the way God feels about things. They don't see class race, or anything else. They see people as either saved or unsaved, and they love them, and they show them the kindness, and they live out their faith in truth and in, in the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it is right there. But you know, the devil, he doesn't want that. He resists the devil. He will flee from you, he says. Draw, come near to God, and he'll come near to you. The Bible says he invites us into his into his throne room through the grace of God. The Bible says, come on in. You can get close to God if you want to, but you gotta want to. Step close, he's right there. He can be Emmanuel, God with us. But how do you view yourself? You view yourself as okay, and you're not. Do you view yourself as, I'm headed to heaven, but maybe you're not? Maybe the proof is in the pudding, like James is trying to say all throughout this book. Where is the witness? Where is the prayer? Where is the word? Where is the devotion? Is your life really measuring? Your talk, does it measure up? Our holy God, does it measure up? So he says, come near to me. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded in picture of me is straddling the fence. We believe one thing, but we, we want this over here. It's like, the old, like, the, like the Bible says, Paul says to Timothy, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, proud, blasphemous, uh, unthankful, unholy, disobedient to parents, they'll be full of greed and lust, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's our nation. We have pleasure everywhere. That's why Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to get in the kingdom of God. Why? Because his riches buy him everything they want to feed the flesh. Is it wrong fish? No, but it is a flesh feeder. Well, it also gets fish to feed your flesh. Is it wrong, is it wrong to, help to go hunting? Is it wrong to go boating? Is it wrong to do this, do that, do that, do this? No, but they're all things that do nothing in the spiritual world. You know, I've heard someone say, you're so spiritually minded, you know earthly good. Here's most of America, though. You're so earthly minded, you know spiritually good. That wasn't funny, Jada. That was serious. Did you hear it? All right. I love Jada. She's precious. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Purify my heart. Cleanse me, Lord, I pray. Remove from me all that is standing in the way of your love. Grieve, mourn, wail. That's repentance, folks. That's seeing yourself in the light of who God is. You see, when we see what God sees and we feel about the way God see, feels about things, we, it all starts when we see God as holy and us as man sees God as our only hope and our salvation. He's the one that brings righteousness into our life. His spirit is the only thing that can control us. It's the only thing that can control our tongue and our actions and even our thoughts. He's the only thing that can change our heart through the power of his grace. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Yes, you're eating, drinking, and being merry for tomorrow we all die, right? Repent. Wail, cry out to God. I cried for three days. I couldn't quit crying when I asked Jesus into my heart and I repented. And I didn't understand any theology. Let me tell you something. You may not agree with theology, but theology doesn't save you. And you're going to be surprised to find out that probably every group, even some that are pointed at and called cults, have people that have done the right thing with Jesus even though they believe the wrong stuff. Because I believe 144,000 is my church that are going to be the only ones in heaven, does that mean I can't go to heaven? It depends on what I did with Jesus. You see, because Jesus comes into my heart to save me. What did I do with Jesus? Do I walk with him? Is he with me? Is he alive in me? Am I attentive to him? Because he says, those of you that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. But those of you who live that according to the flesh will bring death, and you will not be the sons of God. Romans chapter 8. See, it's what you do with Jesus, what you do with his spirit that makes you born again and pours power and grace into your heart. That's why you humble yourselves before the Lord. It says it again. You stay humble, guys, and he'll lift you up. That's the hand of God, Pastor Hawkins says, picking you up. And boy, you're picked up. How you view yourself affects 
how your relationships with each other, your relation, how you relate to God, and 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 and. and, and it says, brothers and sisters, there it is again, verse 11, that has again, have to do with the relationship. Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them, speaks against the law, or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but setting a judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and one judge. The one's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Who do you think you are? Who are you to judge your neighbor? Who do you think you are? Who are you to judge your neighbor? I hate being judged. Somebody posted on there, ripping on a church, people that were judging them, and then other people that, that didn't believe in God and can't stand quote-unquote organized religion as if God didn't organize it. I mean, he placed officers in place. He even has one gift that's called administration. You know what that is? Organization. Don't tell me there's no organization in the church. That's why you put certain people as, you don't put a novice as an elder. Right? That's all part of organization. But they jump on there and they're just, that's why they're just ripping on that because a true Christian was hurt and popped on Facebook and I hate public posts like that. It's stupid. If you didn't hear me before, stop it. Doesn't change anybody. If you don't like something, get to know them, love them enough to understand where they're coming from, then share where the biblical thing where you're coming from, and it'll change their heart out of relationship, not by just getting on and venting. And quit venting about the person in front of you driving or the coworker as if they don't read your post. Stop it. It's all crazy. If you want to talk to somebody, talk to them in the face and quit being a chicken. <laughs> That's <was> funny. <laughs> Your mama shouldn't have told me that, Jada. I'm sorry. <laughs> she just told me <laughs> that you don't think I'm funny. <laughs> oh, you think you are? You're not anybody to judge your neighbor. Oh, I think Jesus, the half brother, uh, uh, James is half brother. Jesus they had the same father. No, I had the same mother. Sorry. Okay, yeah, that was wrong. I just. I just unpreached the virgin birth. <laughs> that was a mistake. I think Jesus said it this way. Get the plank out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in your neighbor's eye. Because in that post, they were throwing every church under the bus as a bunch of Christians that are a bunch of judgmental people. That's baloney. I'm not. Y'all might be, but I'm not. And I don't believe you're that way either. I think you're gracious. Sometimes you have blind spots. Some of you need to be slapped a little bit. But you don't know it. You're just ignorant to how you are. You can't see that you're like that. You just need someone to lovingly come in a relationship and say, Hey, uh, did you realize this? You go, ah! <laughs> yeah, it needs to change. Have me ever corrected any of my blind spots? Keep your head down. They'll put your hand down. Who do you think you are? Now listen, verse 13. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. In other words, you make plans without consulting God. Later in that passage it says you should say if the Lord will. That's a mistake that I made when about this house. I didn't ask God. I didn't ask anybody else any advice. I just thought, well... Just out of my fear, just thought, well, that's not a good time. I don't really want to spend that much more money. We've got enough to build what we want. We'll get it later. I was wrong. I should have done it right then. In the meantime, I woke up middle of the night a lot of times praying, saying, God, help me get out of that. And I thank God that we came out smelling about the same way we would have smelled back then. We, we did good. And I thank God for that. But, you know, sometimes we just do that. We just, we just live like the, the tomorrow is forever. We just make our plans and we just go, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And God's saying, who do you think you are? You don't even know about tomorrow. It says, look at it says, is he going to remember? Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Who do you think you are? You don't know about tomorrow. Oh, what was Jesus say? He said, oh, you can't add one inch to your height or take it away. Sermon on the Mount. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, oh, it says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough to worry about itself, Sermon on the Mount. Right? Uh, don't you see that I take care of the sparrow when it falls? I see it. 
how, how I clothe, clothe the field with lilies and, and, and how beautiful. So, so just, hey, seek God with all your heart first and his righteousness and all these other things be added. Don't worry about it. You don't know about tomorrow. Listen, you can save all the money you got. In your, I mean, the world could get wiped out. The financial systems could just collapse. And those of you, we all come back to level ground. We got nothing. And that's when I'm calling you people that know how to farm up. And I'm going to say, uh, my backyard needs a garden. <laughs> I, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's about perspective. It's about attitude. And how you view God affects how you view yourself. And if you think you don't need God, you're mistaken. Because it says, why you don't even know what happened tomorrow? What is your life? I'm going to say this again. Who do you think you are? Now look at the scripture. You are a mist that appears for a little while then vanishes. A mist. Like this. <laughs> Gone. That was a weaver mist. Oh, you didn't see it over here, did you? <laughs> that's what you are. A mist. But that's just talking about the brevity of your life. In a blink, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, Jesus is coming back. And I'm telling you, the signs are all around us. And there's no time to play church, folks. It's a time to get serious about God. Every day, morning, noon, and night. Every 15 minutes, you need Jesus. Humble yourself. Cry out to God. Stay focused. Stay in the Word. Don't get caught up with that which passes away. It's temporary. Live for the things that money can't buy and death can't take away. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Live for God. That's all that matters. You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So who do you think you are? Instead, you ought to say, if it is Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to work in you to live like Christ lived. He went about doing good. He went about doing good. Always inviting people to faith to come to me, and that's what we're to do. We're to be Jesus' hands, his mouth, his feet, his heart. How do you view God? How do you view yourself? I want to I want to turn the, the corner here. How many of you believe that the Holy Spirit has saved you by Jesus Christ, that His power of His grace has come into your heart, changed your heart, and you have a desire to follow after God? Lift your hand high, say, hello, here I am. Let me tell you something. Who do you think you are? You're a child of God. You have the same Spirit in you that raised Jesus from the dead. You can do miracles for greater things than these shall you do because I go to my Father and I send my Holy Spirit in you. You don't need to worry about what anybody else is thinking. You need to worry about what God is thinking and what's going in you and what's going to happen. You are somebody that they can kill your body, but God will raise you up. He'll take you to heaven. You can, they can hurt you and God will heal you. So you are a child of God, a child of the King. But never forget, why? Don't boast in anything but the Lord. And remember from where you came, that there go I by the grace of God. And realize that you are a child of God with the purpose that has a plan for you, to prosper, to, to prosper you, to use you. You are gifted by God in unique giftings. And the Holy Spirit will use you. So rise up because what you believe about yourself will either keep you from fulfilling God's plan in your life or release you into filling, fulfilling God's plan in your life. Are you with me? So you go to the four year and afterwards you greet each other. And if you're thinking too much about yourself, you're, you're afraid to speak to anybody. But if you're not thinking about yourself and you're looking at someone else, you're looking at everyone, you're going, hello there, hello there. Who, who are you? I don't think I know you. Oh, you've come here 28 years, so the church has only been here 26. Quit lying to me. And, and you know, whatever. That was funny, Jada. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, guys, listen. God wants to use us. But if we, if we don't first realize and remember that it's about Jesus, it's about his spirit, it's about his forgiveness, it's about his grace, it's about his empowerment, and if we don't stay on our knees, if we don't stay in connection, if we don't keep filling ourselves up, we're gonna, we leak. 
We leak. Dr. Wade Nunn, remember? We all leak. So we need to be continuously, Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, continuously having the Holy Spirit and the power of His love and the power of His grace flowing through us so that we can impact the world as light and as salt. But if you're proud, if you forget that God is the source, if you think somehow it's you, you're in trouble. Then you become the freak on television that's trying to do miracles of God and helping by pushing people over. Or the evangelist that says, Pastor, uh, if you really want to see God move, just put your hand here when you pray for him and lift up a little bit because once their head's back, then it encourages them to go ahead and fall. Yeah, evangelist told me that. Oh, wow. Happens all the time. Watch television. It's the most entertaining thing you can do is Christian television. And that mocks the fact that there's something real called the power of God that'll take you down. It doesn't need man's help. It'll bring you to the ground, make you into a puddle of nothingness, and work you over. The power of God is unlimited. Who you think God is affects a lot who you believe you are. You read his word. And I'm so tired of people saying, I think this, I think that, and it's against the word. Well, I don't think this is right. I know over here a rewriting or saying, well, God didn't mean this. Baloney. I don't want to know what you think. I want to know what the Bible says. I don't know what anybody else thinks. I want to know what God said. So we close with this verse, and then after I read it, the musicians will come. And I'm going to ask you whether you're already saved or not, and you want to truly be a person that God flows through like a vessel and that you're clean. You're not a corroded uh, uh, transmitter of God's power and spirit and grace, but you're clean. You're going to cleanse your hands and purify your hearts and get to this altar in a minute. Here it is, Romans 1, 8, 13, 18 30 to 32. I believe Paul says the same thing James says in 4 right here. Whether you, you know, and you're going to, so, you know, it's just plain as can be. This is plain as can be, so whatever you think about all of this, this is what God says. I don't want to hear what you think about it. I want you to hear what God says in his word. Verse 18, Romans 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. No excuses, judgment day. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. What do we worship today? People, stars, musicians, singers, athletes, whoever. We're always looking for someone because it's just our nature to have a God. We just got to have something we look up to, but that no flesh should boast, Paul said. Only boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Only boast in the Lord. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Can we, I didn't want y'all to come until I was finished and reading, but that's okay. Come on. Y'all, we're stopping while they come. Come on, everybody, get up here. Whoever's coming, come on. I know what you do, because I do it too. As soon as they come, you watch them, because they're prettier than me. Okay? I know y'all. I see you. All right, are we ready? We get ready, get set, and we're ready to go. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Verse 26. Look at it. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men 
and receive themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a deprived, depraved mind so that they would do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree, they... they, they that righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. In other words, you may not do it, but you watch it in the television and on movies. That would be today's application. What am I saying? I'm saying our world has made their own God that doesn't look like anything like the holy God that I serve. And it's so easy to get boiled slowly like a frog when you put it in a pan and turn up the heat slowly. It'll stay right in the frying pan, right in the boiler. And we're in a culture that is so unholy, so selfish, so sinful, so greedy. And yet we keep thinking politics is going to change it. I would venture to say, and I don't know it because it sounds judgmental, but the majority of our politicians on a national level, if they're not already there, they get there when they get there, they either get caught up with one of the big three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. If it's, not, if it's not one, it's greed. It's power. It's not serving. There's no statesman. It's getting reelected that matters. It's not doing what's right before God. And I'm telling you right now, our only hope is to be the church, to rise up and be the church. And live for Jesus Christ fully, holy, totally committed. This song says it. The song starts with what you think about for yourself. It's going to end up affecting uh, what you do. And I don't know what happened to my words. I wrote them down there. Pop the words up there if you would. So I can read it because I thought I had them right here. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion. My soul now to stand. You're going to stand before God. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. Christ has done it, not you. No boasting, but except for in Jesus. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say and what can I do but offer this heart, oh God, completely to you? Is it really completely his? So I walk upon salvation. That's what I'm going to stand on. The God, my Savior, the joy of my salvation is God. Your spirit is alive in me. I'm not just a, a religious doctrinal person. No, Jesus, you've come. I'm alive in you. Your spirit lives in me. The same spirit that raised Christ the dead, the same spirit that was in Jesus as the man when he walked upon earth can be in us. It's alive in me. My life to declare your promise. I stand on the truth of this word. My soul will stand. So I offer my life completely to you. And I stand with arms high and heart abandoned. Hallelujah, offering my all.